I mean, at the moment, uh, we're suffering the same inflation that you are for the same reasons, but we don't realise the cause and uh, we're going down exactly the wrong road to analyse it and therefore deal with it. And the money that was thrown at the pandemic uh, invariably ended up with new money being created. That takes about 12 to 18 months. Then you get the inflation. The inflation is now. But of course, the politicians and, uh, and the experts uh, want to persuade you that this inflation is currently caused. In other words, it's the UK crisis, it's uh, um, commodity prices, it's supply chain problems. It isn't. It was caused by the Fed. It was caused by the Bank of England. Welcome to this RTD interview. Today, I'm excited to have returning guest, Professor John Hearn, who's joining us again to share his thoughts on the economy as well as overall market conditions. Uh, so, John, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing very well, thank you. Uh, and uh, same for you, I hope. Yes, I, I'm doing quite well and uh, definitely looking forward to speaking with you. As I mentioned before, uh, it's been a while since we've connected, but always curious to get your thoughts on what's happening, especially within your own country, the UK. But before we dive in, I'm curious to get your thoughts on the state of the economy in the UK, you know, from the, on this side, we're hearing a lot of things in reference to the British pound flash crash and government debt and all those things similar to here, but it appears to be more advanced in the UK. Can you give us your assessment on what's happening and uh, the current state and confidence in the, in the overall government amongst the British people? Yeah. I mean, at the moment, uh, we're suffering the same inflation that you are for the same reasons, but we don't realize the cause and uh, we're going down exactly the wrong road to analyse it and therefore deal with it. Uh, in both your country and uh, in the UK, the current inflation is all down to the pandemic. It's a time lag of 12 to 18 months before these things hit the economy in terms of inflation. And the money that was thrown at the pandemic uh, invariably ended up with new money being created. That takes about 12 to 18 months, and then you get the inflation. The inflation is now, but of course the politicians and, uh, and the experts uh, want to persuade you that this inflation is currently caused. In other words, it's the UK cri crisis, it's uh, um, commodity prices, it's supply chain problems. It isn't. It was caused by the Fed. It was caused by the Bank of England. Now, what they have actually done, both have tightened considerably. Uh, so we can expect that inflation is going to start to fall for a short period of time in both countries. Uh, but of course, all the experts are predicting it will carry on rising because they're looking at the costs of things. They're not looking at the monetary aggregates in the economy. So in the UK, we would expect a dip coming up fairly soon. But then, unfortunately, uh, there's probably going to be another pickup because the state of the UK economy at the moment is you can do one of two things. And we've had a mini budget. We've had uh, a new prime minister. And you can increase spending if you increase taxation. Or you can cut spending if you cut taxation. What we're trying to do is to uh, increase spending and cut taxation. So that leads to a larger borrowing requirement. Now, that borrowing requirement has to be financed one way or another, despite what some uh, economic theories say. It's got to be financed. And the world, I think, is just looking at a large borrowing requirement in the UK and going, hey, can I better finance that? There's only two ways you can finance it. One is you've got to sell it to real people, in which case you've got to make it attractive and interest rates have got to go up considerably. Or you can try again. You can try printing money and see if you can get away with it uh, and you'll cause inflation, but it will be down the line. You know, it'll, after this dip, it would be another year or so before it starts to pick up and then you might have blamed something else. So that's the sort of situation that we're in. Most countries around the world are in it. Uh, we're in it, if you like, a little worse uh, than, than other countries because we've made announcements and, and markets are sort of analysing this and going, yes, this is not, uh, which, this is not good. Uh, the result of that is the pound has fallen. Um, and uh, what are we about one eight against the dollar at the moment? Uh, no currency is strong 
because as you would know yourself, the dollar is not strong in America because you've got high inflation. Mm -hmm. The dollar is just strong on Forex markets at the moment because it's not quite as weak as other currencies. So it looks as though it's a, it's a stronger currency. Uh, but basically, it is a worldwide problem. There aren't many uh, countries that are going to get away with financing a pandemic uh, just by throwing money at it uh, and not actually solving the problem in terms of producing more goods and services and producing solutions. All right. Now, on, on the ground there, uh, I imagine uh, due to the cost of living concerns, a lot of Brits are probably feeling the pinch. You know, you got high energy costs as well as a plummeting, you know, currency for the most part. Therefore, savers are, are being uh, destroyed. And so definitely the current government policy of trying to, I guess, cut taxes, but also increase spending is it seems like it's going to be a failed policy all in and of itself. And so how much longer can you think, do you think they can get away with this before people realize that government might be too far along to actually save things, if at all? I don't think it's much longer because the alternative is, say, the Labour Party who are saying exactly the same thing. Uh, they want to come to power, they want to raise taxes, but they also want to raise expenditure. Uh, so they want a, a bigger borrowing requirement as well. So there is no one out there talking about the solution. And when you mention savers, that's quite important because you've had since the global financial crisis, Rates of interest down very low, almost zero, zerp, if you like. That means savers have been paying for the last 10 years uh, because they've been losing out. Those people who've been borrowing money, particularly on mortgages, have done very well. Um, I, I go back to when I had a mortgage and I was paying anything between uh, about 7 and 15% interest on those mortgages. They've been paying somewhere between 0 and 1.5. Uh, and now... If interest rates go up, that will be of some help to the savers, redressing the balance, if you like. But it's going to be a big cost to those people who have uh, mortgages. And of course, the people who suffer most are the people who've just started mortgages. If you started 10 years ago, you've had a 10 year run of very low interest rates and very low mortgage payments. If you started uh, last week or last month or last year, you're going to have financial plans which say, right, we're going to pay this amount for the next 25 years. And then you suddenly find, no, we're not. We're going to have to pay three times that amount. Um, and it becomes you know, quite damaging. And there's no real solution at the moment. It is quite difficult times for all countries, and particularly so for us. This is why the Bank of England is sitting, sitting there twiddling their thumbs. They don't really know what to do. Do we put interest rates up uh, um, in order to try and protect the pound? Do we put interest rates up to try and bring down the rate of inflation? Um, or do we go against that? And do we try and boost the economy by another lot of quantitative easing and keeping interest rates low? They don't really know what they're doing. Right. And one thing I find to be very interesting is that uh, as of now, the Bank of England appears to be the first central bank that has admitted to a actual uh, recession right now, where over here, the Federal Reserve is trying to you know, prolong things and they're re reshuffling the, the definition of recession. So that caught me by surprise. But it looks like heading into 2023, there's a, a lot of concerns of this recession probably uh, getting a lot worse. Uh, could we be on the cusp uh, with, with either with either what's happening in Europe or the UK, and of course the US is not you know not much farther along, uh, going beyond a recession, borderline depression type of uh, event where things completely unravel due to Ukraine or whatever else narrative they want to try to feed us. Well, that's the worrying thing, of course, isn't it? Because so many things are going on around the world, and if you look at world news. Every day is bad news, isn't it? Something's happening here. Something's blown up there. Some flood there. Yeah. Um, Putin with his finger on a button. Um, <laughs> sham elections to try and say, yes, you all want to stay in within Russia, don't you? Lots of things going on at the moment, which you can see will tip over. The whole world is a happier place when it grows. So when the economies grow around the world, there's more for everyone to share. When they stop growing and they stop growing, as I said before, as a result of really the bad policies that have been pursued uh, over the last few years, as soon as they stop growing, then people can only become better off by taking it away from somebody else. And that's when the conflict starts and when the battles start uh, and, uh, and when you, you know, find one lot against another. And I don't see a quick solution. Let me tell you what the solution is, and you won't like it, no one would like it, but the only way to get out of this is actually to put interest rates up, to get interest rates back to a level where they are 
market rates, if you like, where there's a rate between lending and borrowing, where the lenders are rewarded and the borrowers are paying a reasonable price. So you need to get your interest rates uh, up. Uh, you need to get your government spending down. I'm quite happy for taxes to go down because I like economic growth and economic growth only comes from the private sector of the economy. Governments can't grow the economy. They just waste money left, right and centre. So you're looking for the private sector to invent innovate new ideas that's where economic growth comes from and so what you've got to do is release the private sector which means you've got to get the government out of it they've got to stop spending and i would i would say in the uk and the us have a, have a rule a regulation that central uh, governments have got to balance their budgets and they've got to balance their budgets until shall we say their uh, national debt falls to 25% or below. In other words, probably for the next 30 years, they're going to have to balance their budgets until they've bought everything back. That will sort of release the private sector. Uh, but of course, it, it shows governments as not doing anything. Right. No government can go, I'm, not, I'm going to solve this problem. I'm going to grow the economy. I can spend more money. I can cut taxes. I can do this. It's very difficult for a government in a democracy to sit back and go, We'll leave it to you. We'll, we'll just look after the things we can do best. We'll look after the supply and the public good. We'll try and support education and health, the important things. But basically, we'll leave the economy alone to, to grow. And then we'll take the fruits of that because as the economy grows, taxation automatically increases. Governments automatically have more to spend. But that's a difficult road to get back on uh, when you've gone so uh, such a long way down one path. Right. Then suddenly go over and get that one right. That's the only way out, and I can't see any government that can stand up and explain that and actually try and pursue it. Uh, they all want to do what uh, would get them votes and say they tried. You know, we did it. We 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 pumped more money into the economy. We spent on this. We spent on that. Uh, we tried to cut taxes, and although it all went wrong, please, we did try. And you can no, no, but it all went wrong. Right. Uh, that'd be wishful thinking, but it, it appears that, you know, the entire house of cards uh, at this current moment is definitely crumbling. And as a result of that, I can only imagine that just based upon the way things are trending, like if they don't continue to expand the monetary base, then it will definitely implode because it's all debt. It's, it's all centered around debt in of itself. Now, there's also talk. A lot of people are saying that there will be a pivot at some point referring to the Fed pivot, and they're saying probably next year, they've thrown out all these time frames at which the Federal Reserve will have to reverse course. I'm of the mindset that a lot of what we're experiencing is, is strategically planned for, you know, some, some future plans that they have for us in reference to the whole central bank digital currencies and things of that nature. But uh, what are your thoughts on a pivot? Could, could they reverse course, stop tightening, actually outright easy, and we just take off just because they just flood the world to try to save it in a sense? Is yeah. that the probability you think? Yeah, that, that doesn't, you know, that I presume it's the same sort of terminology in America. It's kicking the can down the road. Uh, right. that, that's all it does. It, it's going to kick the can down the road. And what uh, is uh, bad now will become even worse in the future. It's, it's the very opposite. You can't flood markets with money and expect anything to happen unless you believe in things like modern monetary theory. Uh, you can't flood the markets. You've got to let markets work. Uh, it's like, you know, the energy crisis. How do you deal with the energy crisis? You let prices go up. You let prices go up so that people start to use it more carefully. Other people look for alternative ways of finding energy. Uh, you don't put a cap on it. You don't try and keep its price down. You don't subsidize. That's interfering with the market and interfering uh, with the price mechanism. And uh, whenever governments have done that in the past, the result has always been the very opposite of what they wanted. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm curious to get your thoughts on um, with the bond market, basically, you know, yields are taken off and obviously, obviously a reflection of lack of confidence as well as the currency itself having issues. Do you see uh, more people probably waking up to the reality of understanding the difference between the fiat currency as well as traditional sound lawful money at some point, just because as a result of the pound crashing, I noticed that uh, gold prices reached an all-time high. And of course, me on my side, encouraging people to understand the importance of sound money. Do you see that that being an anchor where people can preserve uh, some of their purchasing power while all this stuff you know, plays out? 
Yeah, I mean, it's that's the only thing you can really do is to try and look for an alternative. Gold has always uh, been something that would uh, uh, protect you over the longer term. Fiat currencies are um, unfortunately inherently weak. Uh, there is no alternative. The uh, the digital currencies and uh, and Bitcoin and other they are fundamentally flawed because they could never be currencies. They're too volatile. Um, the expectation that they might stabilise at some point in the next hundred years that uh, doesn't happen at all. It's it's not going to be an alternative. So um, the fiat system has either got to be really controlled by a central bank. The gold exchange standard did it, strangely enough. Uh, gold standard did it. But when you had the gold exchange standard after Bretton Woods between sort of 71 and, and 92, that kept things fairly stable because every country was disciplined by the other country. In other words, if you pump too much money in your economy, sucked in imports, couldn't sell exports, you'd have a current account crisis and your exchange rate would want to go down, but it's fixed against the dollar uh, and therefore you don't do it because then if you do that, you've got to devalue your currency and it's very obvious that you... So all countries trying to compete to keep their economies, sorry, their currencies stable does in fact work to keep their economies stable. But I don't think we'll go back on a gold exchange standard, but the gold exchange standard is much better than a current situation where people are just fighting for what's the best way to throw money at something and get it to uh, to grow the economy. All right. I understand that. And so that's one of the things I love to encourage people to you. Ultimately, you have to create your own standard just because you can't expect government as well. as Central banks to come in and actually go against their own policies by saying, hey, dump our currencies and get into something real and stable. Um, as we draw towards the end, I'm curious to get your thoughts on the dollar right now, the Dixie 113, whatever it might be. And it's basically strengthening because every other currency that's measured up against it is failing. But then again, at some point, the dollar will have its day, I believe. I don't know how to play out, but it's inevitable because it's the same model as every other currency. Uh, do you think uh, that that future draws near for the dollar to also experience some type of hiccup or because everything is weighted or measured in USD, it can be prolonged a little bit and the Fed can get away with some policies that may, they may not be able to, abar apart from having the reserve currency as of right now. It's, um, it's hiccuping in America, obviously, because you're finding the value of your dollars going down. You're having to pay more to buy things. Mm -hmm. But because it is the reserve currency of the world, it's perceived as being the strongest currency in the world. And because all currencies are weak, and that's not quite as weak as the other currencies, it's going up in terms of the fact it's going down more slowly than the other currencies. Now, that then creates a vision in people's mind that that's the currency to be in. You know, all other currencies are going down, but that's the strong currency. And then you, you pile into that currency. And that really means that on Forex markets at the moment, the dollar is probably overvalued against almost all currencies. And like you say, there's a day of reckoning there when things have got to readjust. But because of the size of the American economy, because it's a reserve currency, all the damage to the dollar is almost internalized. The external damage to the dollar is, is not as great. I suppose it's a very good time for everyone in America to go on holiday in the UK and all over the world uh, and use their dollars to buy currencies which are now relatively cheap and enjoy themselves in other parts of the world because their dollars in their own country are going down in value 10% um, a year if uh, this sort of inflation rate is sustained. Interesting. We are very interesting times. Um, as we draw towards the end, I'm curious to get your thoughts. Um, you know, how, how just looking ahead, yep. um, if the Fed pivots, central banks decide to go the opposite way, which I think they probably will, um, the words hyperinflation, you know, that's something that is a probable result of, you know, if they reverse policy and decide to flood the world with currency to try to protect and save us, uh, yep. could we see a hyperinflationary type of event, whether it be from the dollar side, you know, within UK, the euro yeah. is crumbling. We didn't even talk about the euro yeah. much, but what are your thoughts? High inflation, I think, not hyperinflation, because central banks do know how to control hyperinflation. The hyperinflation, you're talking about 50% inflation a month. Mm -hmm. High inflation, well, 20% a year is high inflation, isn't it? That's the sort of area you can cope with 20% inflation just about 
And that has beneficial effects for government, for the Fed, for the Treasury, because it reduces the value of all their debt. And governments are the biggest debtors around. And in real terms, that shrinks debt. Uh, so there is an opportunity, if you like, to go through a sustained period of high inflation. But it's going to be very damaging. And as we all know, it's going to be damaging to real people all the time, rather than to uh, the, the people who are pursuing these policies. So I... If you remember, the Fed tried a little bit of QT, quantitative tightening uh, a couple of years back, uh, and it very quickly jumped out of it because it saw itself moving into a problem. And that was because it was the only country that was really trying to tighten at the time. All countries are thinking of tightening now. And if you look at the broad money aggregates, they have tightened. There is some downturn in the growth in broad money. And that's why I said you're likely to have a dip in inflation towards the end of this year and into next year. But governments are going to go, great, we've got rid of that problem. Inflation is going down. Now, how can we spend more money? How can we cut taxes? Uh, and uh, how do we finance it? Oh, well, we can create more money uh, to finance that because that'll boost. So that could happen. And then you're just going to have this dip and then back up again and how long it goes on. Um, and now I, I can predict things happening. I just don't know when they're going to happen. <laughs> All right. Very true. Very true. Well, Professor Hearn, as always, it's great to connect with you. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. And definitely uh, we'll see how things play out. But I definitely want to check in with you and get your thoughts as to what's happening in your country. And definitely, you know, the whole world is being introduced to something relatively new. I don't think I've never experienced nothing like this in my lifetime. So uh, it's definitely a first time for me, but we'll work our way through it. And of course, you mentioned some, some on a positive side. Uh, understanding the importance of sound money never fails. So uh, that's the best way of probably preserving yourself as well as other opportunities I'm sure out there. But uh, thank you for joining us on RT Interviews. And definitely, uh, can you point people back to you so they can stay plugged in with you? I know you have lectures and things of that nature you share and courses. So feel free to plug yourself if you don't mind. Yes, I mean, there are, if um, if people want to know more about my thoughts, and my thoughts always come with a bit of a, an economics health warning, uh, bearing in mind that uh, I, I disagree with, with lots of other economists and, uh, and official experts. But if you go onto my blog, which is lowercase j-b-h-e-a-r-n dot wordpress dot com, then you can see everything there. There's Recently, there are some chats with a member of the Monetary Policy Committee who... Um, I, I talked some years ago and we had a chat about uh, uh, current things at the Bank of England. There's 27 lectures on there, which are, are linked to YouTube, 10 which introduce economics, 10 which introduce banking and finance and seven higher order ones. And then there are lots and lots of articles. Uh, obviously, the title tells you exactly what they are. But, uh, yeah, they're my take on the world and uh, uh, hopefully... If you read them, you might at least understand what's happening, even if you feel it, uh, not empowered to do anything about it. Sounds good. Well, once again, Professor, appreciate you as always. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And of course, I uh, look forward to connecting with you in the future. Thanks for joining us on RT Thank Interviews. You. Cheers, Mike. Thank you.